It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. During last spring's campaign, in the leaders' debate, I stood next to the Premier when he promised the parent of a child with autism, and I quote, we will be there to support you 1,000 per cent. I promise you, you won't have to be protesting in front of Queen's Park like you have with the Liberal Premier. I want the Conservative Premier to look in the gallery today at families who have come from across Ontario to protest his policies. Does he feel has, he has supported them 1,000 per cent? Please take your seats. Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I remember that, I remember saying it, and I truly believe this. This is the toughest file I've ever dealt with, ever. It has emotions involved, families involved, children involved, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, I know, and I'm sure many of people in this uh, legislature have taken calls. I've taken hundreds of calls, hundreds of calls, and, and, and listened to their stories. We feel, our government, we feel we're doing the right things. When we went into office, Mr. Speaker, it was bankrupt, the system. The system was bankrupt. They funded it to $256 million. We had a run to the Treasury for emergency funds of $100 million. The system was broken, a broken system that the opposition voted Response. for. It was that they actually voted for it. So, order. My, can I continue? Say something wrong. Well, thank you, Premier. We, we normally allow a minute for questions and a minute for responses. At 50 seconds, I normally stand to remind members that their time is almost up. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The reality is, it is this Premier who is breaking people's hearts across our province, Speaker. It is his policies that are breaking people's hearts. The fact is, parents don't feel supported. They feel betrayed. For thousands of parents across Ontario, therapy offers them a chance to truly to connect with and communicate with their own children, sometimes for the very first time. They'll do anything to access supports, but the Premier's scheme asks them to do the impossible. Under these changes, parents estimate their families will be covering 80 to 95 percent of treatment costs out of pocket. That's $80,000 to $90,000 a year on a family budget. Does the Premier believe that paying for 5% of the cost qualifies as 1,000% support? Members, please take their seats. Premier. Do it again. You have to do it again. You have to do it again. Minister of Social Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the passion and the compassion of the member opposite uh, and, and the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, this is a very emotional issue for many of us. Uh, some of us in this uh, legislature have devoted our career for fighting for these families, including myself, the Minister of Health, and my parliamentary assistant, Amy Fee. We've travelled across the province. We have heard from people. But as the Premier has just stated, the system we inherited six and a half months ago was was broken. It was bankrupt. We had to go back to Treasury Board for an additional $100 million so that we could continue to serve just 25 per cent of the population with autism in the province of Ontario. That was heartbreaking. It was gut-wrenching. We had to make a decision so that we could make sure it was fair equitable response sustainable that's why we are moving to a model that directly funds parents and doubles the investment in our diagnostic hubs that's the right thing to do final supplementary well, Speaker, I have to say, for a politician that's been fighting most of her career on behalf of these families, once she's in a position of power, she is supposed to fix it, not make it worse. Not make it worse, Speaker. For parents who are already struggling to make ends meet, the Premier's plan is downright cruel. Under the Ford government changes, families will be cut off from full support if they earn as little as $55,000 a year of income. In other words, two parents, both earning minimum wage, Speaker, are too rich to qualify for full support. How did the Premier decide that two parents earning the minimum wage are too wealthy to deserve the already inadequate support that his scheme provides? Minister. I get the Leader of the Opposition is angry. 
I would ask her to consider the truth and the circumstances that we inherited. With a three, $256 million dollar program that was excluding three out of four children in this province. That means some children were getting some service, but most of the children were getting no service. Speaker, she couldn't look at herself in the mirror if she had to inherit a program like that, just like we in this government couldn't after we had to inject $100 million into this system so we could ensure that places like Erin Oak and Chio could make it through the holidays to support the 25 per cent of the children who were fortunate enough to be in this program. Response. That is why I'm committed to clearing the wait list so that 23,000 children who are denied service in the province of Ontario will get the service they deserve. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Uh, Apologize. Thank you. Next question is for the Premier. Thank you. My next question is for the Premier. Children and their families came here today from across Ontario because they were promised help by this Premier, and instead they are being sold something much, much worse. Can the Premier explain to them how a family earning $55,000 a year, a year is uh, wealthy enough under his scheme to cover more than $80,000 a year in treatment costs? Premier. Minister Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Children, Mr. Community and thanks Social Services. to uh, the member opposite uh, for her question, and uh, thanks to the parents in the gallery who are here today so that we can explain our program. Um, I think that there's some misinformation that I've heard over the last couple of days from the opposition. Right now, they're suggesting that people will be, uh, will be uh, you know, not eligible for support if they're making $55,000. Children, let me be perfectly clear. Um, those between the ages of zero to five will be able to be part of a, a childhood budget right up until they're 18, but the maximum amount of uh, support will be in the early years because we know evidence-based early intervention is key to success. So that's why we want to clear the wait list. Having said that, Order. we are making sure that the most vulnerable people in this program, that is low and medium income earners, should have the most support. But in, to the member's point opposite, that in terms of the 55,000, will be basically Response. getting 98.5 percent of that budget of $140,000 from zero to the 18-year-old. Supplementary. Speaker, I was very clear in my question. I talked about full support, and she just actually agreed that they will not be getting full support exactly. because of their income. These are real people that are here today, Speaker. They want what any parent wants, a fair chance for their kids. I want the Premier to tell parents, uh, the parents of Sebastian, for example, from Waterloo, or Braden, whose parents came here all the way from Kingston, or any of the parents here today, that he still stands by changes that will leave them having to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that they don't have just so they can do basic things like communicate with their own children. And if he doesn't stand by this scheme, what will he do to fix it? Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Um, I guess it comes down to how you view this plan. You think it's okay, or the minister or the member opposite thinks it's okay to only support 25% of the children in the program. Order. This government believes that we should clear the waiting list of 23,000 children who will be on the uh, wait list for an indefinite amount of time. This is a data driven. Uh, pro pro project order. where we have invested additional money in order to support more families with better supports and more choice. We will directly fund parents so that they can make the t decisions that are in the best interest of their children. And I am proud to defend this plan, and I am proud that this government will finally, for the first time in Position Ontario, support 100 per cent of the children in this province that have autism. Final supplement. Uh, speaker, what I don't think is okay, I don't think it's okay for this government to kick families and children with autism to the curb and tell them they're going to have to make it on their own when we all know how expensive the therapies are for children with autism. And the families here, Speaker, are not demanding the impossible. They're asking 
asking the Premier to simply keep his word. But instead of providing promised support, the Ford government is yanking it away. And instead of being a voice for these families in government, the minister responsible threatens families when they don't say nice things about her plan and herself. Enough is enough, Speaker. Will the Premier do the right thing today? Tell your minister, tell his minister that she has to resign, then tear up this failed scheme and replace it with a new plan backed with actual investment Question. that provides parents with the support for their children that they were promised during the campaign. Members, please take their seats. Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. Um, I'm proud of this plan because, for the first time in Ontario history, we will clear the wait list by doubling the investment the opposition in to order. and directly funding parents so that they can make the best choices for their children, whether that is behavioral therapy, whether that's respite care, whether that's technological aids, and whether that is caregiver training. We are committed to doing this. And for the uh, member opposite um, to, to suggest that this plan will change, is nothing short, Speaker, of providing false hope to those who think it will change. Because I can tell Opposition you, Mr. Premier, and this government have full confidence in this plan. I will make sure this plan is implemented, and I will be the minister responsible for the autism program who implements this program. Thank you. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. And I just want to start by saying you have it all wrong. There is nothing evidence-based about your plan. Nothing. <laughs> Nancy. I'm going to interrupt the House again to remind members, all members, to make their comments through the chair. The member for Hamilton Mountain should put her question. Speaker, Nancy has twin seven-year-old boys with severe autism. Right now, they are in 30 hours a week of intensive therapy. They are learning how to feed themselves and have just started to communicate with their mom. Their therapy costs $60,000 a year each. Under the new OAP, which is the government's new PROUD program, they will receive less than $5,000 a year each. Nancy is afraid her children will never learn to live independently. They will never have the quality of life that they deserve. The new program Question. is devastating for Nancy and her family. Will the minister help parents like Nancy stop the changes to the OAP and instead commit to investing in needs and evidence-based services? Thank you. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite for bringing Nancy's story to the Ontario Legislative Assembly. Um, I think the member opposite has to understand the complexity of this situation, the fact that we have decided to invest in early intervention, where we know that that is evidence-based, where we are going to allow for a flexible childhood family budget for families like Nancy's to get the services that they need. But where I think the member opposite forgets part of the equation is that three out of four children in the order. province of Ontario have been denied support by their Ontario government because of the way the program was uh, set up. Children, 23,000, were languishing on a wait list for an indefinite amount of time, meaning we could have a five-year-old child on the uh, wait list and would age out of the program by the time they were 18 without getting a call for service. That is wrong. It's unconscionable and it's Response. immoral. And that's why we have moved to a direct funding model and we're doubling the investment in diagnostic hubs. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Speaker, this minister doesn't seem to understand that these are children that we're talking about. They are not numbers on a list. By, by giving each child a minimal amount is wasting the money. You're actually wasting more money than the government's the Liberal government's failed plan. Your plan is worse. 
Tatiana is a mom of three kids. Two of them are on the spectrum. One of her boys is receiving therapy now, and is, the other one is on the wait list. Her one son is getting $60,000 a year in services. The new program would give her less than $5,000 a year. Tatiana can't afford to pay for this on her own, and her boys will regress. She's afraid that they will never be ready to go to school. For her other son on the wait list, she she is willing to wait because she knows that proper services are worth it in the end for her children. Will the minister listen to the families who have come here today, admit that her plan needs more work, and they'll go back to the drawing board? Thank you. Thank you. Minister? Thanks very much, Speaker, and thanks for bringing Tatiana's story to, uh, to this assembly. Those were the exact types of stories that were so heartbreaking and gut-wrenching when we inherited this program and found out that Tatiana's son would be on that wait list for an indefinite amount of time, meaning he would likely never get off it uh, because of the way this system was broken. That's why we went to the uh, Treasury Member for Essex, to come to Member for, for Hamilton Mountain, come to the program for only 25 per cent of the children afloat. 23,000 children may not be a lot to the, to the members opposite, but my job is to protect every single child that has autism in this program, in this project, and that's what I'm doing. We're making sure that Position to to get direct funding support so she can make the best decisions for her child who's already receiving support as well, sadly, as the child that was not going to get off the wait list, but I can commit Bonds. today, within the next 18 months, he will be off this wait list. Next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's government for the people was elected with a mandate to improve public safety across this province and to provide the brave and dedicated men and women of our police services with the tools and resources they need to perform their duties safely and effectively. Before the last election, the Liberal government passed the most anti-police legislation in Canadian history, a deeply flawed piece of legislation that ignored the everyday realities of the difficult jobs our dedicated and brave police officers are asked to do. Shame. To restore respect to these heroes in Ontario's community, our government paused the implementation of Bill 175. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please update the members Question. of this legislature on how the comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act will make Ontario safer and treat police with fairness and respect? Good question. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you. Thank you for the member from Mississauga Streetfield for the, her important question and congratulations on becoming a uh, grandma. You know, Ontario's government for the people was elected with a mandate to fix the Liberals' broken policing legislation to fulfill our fundamental responsibility of keeping Ontario communities safe. I'm proud to say that yesterday, Ontario's government for the people introduced the Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act. This legislation is central to our commitment to making Ontario safer, standing up for victims, and holding criminals accountable for their actions. Police deserve our gratitude and respect, not our suspicion and scorn. That's why our government is providing police with the tools, resources and support they need to do their jobs, often quietly and heroically. The previous Liberal government's legislation did not even pay Response. lip service to the principle of fairness or due process for police officers. Not only was this unfair, it was disrespectful to the police officers. And, Speaker, we are fixing that with this new legislation. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her response and I am proud to stand here today knowing that our government is delivering on its promise to restore fairness and respect for our brave and dedicated police officers here. right here in Peel Region, where I was inspired by their dedication by joining them on a ride-along just a few weeks ago. The men and women of our police services now know that our government is listening to them and will continue to work to ensure public safety across this great province. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain to the House how this proposed legislation will keep everyone in Ontario safe by improving training and making governance work better? Good question. Minister. Thank 
thank you again to the member. There is no greater responsibility for a government than public safety, and this government has been focused on this top priority since day one. To act on our mandate from the people of Ontario and keep the promise we made to improve safety across this great province, we have proposed legislation to improve governance, training, and transparency. As an early response to Justice Tullock's report on street checks, we will mandate human rights, systemic racism, diversity, and Indigenous culture and rights training for new police officers and special constables. We will make successful completion of training mandatory for members of police services boards. Our proposed legislation will also maintain First Nation policing provisions to provide First Nations with the ability to opt in to Ontario's policing legislation. Community safety Response. goes beyond policing itself, and so does our proposed legislation. We are also proposing amendments to the Mandatory Blood Testing Act, and I look forward to debating this legislation in the days to come. Well done. Thank you. Next question. Member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last Saturday, our office hosted an emergency roundtable about the government's changes to autism services. At the roundtable, I met Laura, who I'm pleased to say is joining us here at Queen's Park today. Laura's son, Noah, is seven years old, living with autism. After years on the wait list, Noah finally started receiving ABA therapy, and he's making huge strides, including sleeping in his own bed and being able to sit at the table with a non-preferred food item. Why is the minister ending coverage of this beautiful seven-year-old and therapy? Why is that not helping enough? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thanks very much, Speaker. appreciate the question from the member opposite. I did miss him on Saturday when we were supposed to be playing hockey in his riding. Um, we did win that game. Um, happy, to, uh, happy to say that uh, though we have— um, Oh, they're supposed to be on my team. Um, Let's bring a moment of levity here because this is an emotional Order. issue. And while we understand that 25% of the children were receiving a sport, we understand also that 75% of the children weren't. And so I have an obligation as the minister responsible for this program to ensure that we, that we allow every child in Ontario the opportunity to get some level of support. Opposition, come to it's order. unfair, it's unequal, and Member it's unsustainable Essex, come to, to order. continue with the previous Liberal government's plan. So we're going to continue to support and open this process for Hamilton by Mountain, come to order. doubling of diagnostic response. costs, as we have at Holland Bloorview and at Erin Oaks and at Chio, and we're going to make sure that once those children are cleared off that diagnostic diagnosis hub, we are going to ensure Thank you. Supplementary. The clock starting after they stop clapping. Thank you, Speaker. Unfair. Back to the minister. Let's talk about unfair. I think it's unfair to be giving out a tax cut in this province to the richest Ontarians that will cost $275 million while families with autism aren't getting the support they deserve. That's unfair. You want to talk about unfair? I think it's unfair that this government is cutting corporate income taxes by a billion dollars when families with autism can't get the support they deserve. That's unfair. It's time for Laura. It's time for all the families who are here to have a government that will be on their side, and that requires rethinking this plan. That is not giving people false hope, Speaker. That is asking our friends in government to collegially rethink this program so we don't ruin our public school system, so Question. we support the families that need our support. Will the minister commit to changing her mind, listening to parents, and working with us? It's passion for this. It's an important issue for the 25 per cent of the parents who were receiving the support uh, from this program. But I have to look at all children on this program. That's why we have to extend support to the other 23,000. That's why we have increased our budget from this program from $256 million to $321 million. That is why we went in for an emergency $100 million to, from Treasury Board to ensure that we could keep this program alive. But, Speaker, I have to say we must 
ensure that we have appropriate levels of support for all children, not just one in four. That's wrong. It's unconscionable. Opposition come to order. It was unsustainable the way the previous government had run it. So I'm going to stand here and I will, I will let the member opposite know. This plan is the plan that will be implemented. To suggest to parents otherwise is to provide false Order. hope Response. to vulnerable families, and I won't have it. Next question, the member for Brampton South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Every day, 100,000 men and women uh, across this province go to work in the auto sector, including thousands from my riding, Brampton South. Recently, the minister and the premier were at the auto show where they unveiled our government's auto plan entitled Driving Prosperity, a plan to keep these jobs in Ontario. Ontario was North America's top auto-producing region in 2017, building almost 2.2 million vehicles with thousands of those vehicles right in Brampton. I know that our government for the people is committed to ensuring the future of a thriving auto sector in Ontario. Can the minister inform the House about the steps our government Question. is taking as part of driving prosperity to ensure the future of our auto sector. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thanks, Speaker, and I thank the member for the great question. This morning, last week, I did have the pleasure of introducing our auto plan for Ontario Driving Prosperity, which ensures that we continue to build over 2 million vehicles and maybe even more in Ontario so that we can employ hundreds of thousands of people in the supply chain. You know, One of the key pillars of our Driving Prosperity plan is innovation, and I just want to elaborate on how the lines have blurred a bit in the auto industry between an auto manufacturer and a tech company. We have more than 200 uh, businesses that are currently operating in the tech sector in the automobile industry. So companies like Google and Ford and GM and BlackBerry, QNX and Apple, they're all working in this space to ensure that we're enhancing uh, the autonomous vehicle, the vehicle of the future, and that's why we've committed to invest Spons. in the AVIN program. That's why we're creating a new winter tech development stream, and we certainly have advantages in Canada, in Ontario, to develop that next phase of the autonomous vehicle, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we're driving prosperity with our auto plan. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, back to the minister. Speaker, I know the minister is committed to a future, a strong future for the auto sector in Ontario, and the families in Brampton and across this province are counting on his leadership. I know that many of the principles that the minister has laid out as part of our government's uh, open for business strategy are also part of our driving prosperity plan for the auto sector. Right now, the government has Bill 66 before the House to try to reduce the burden of red tape on Ontario businesses. Can the minister tell the House how our, uh, our approach to red tape and regulatory reform is going to work to help our plan for Ontario's auto sector? Minister. And thanks again uh, to the great member for the great question. Uh, we have made a commitment to reduce red tape, not just in the auto sector, but in manufacturing and agriculture and agri-food and the mining and northern development and forestry sectors by 25 per cent by 2020. That's so that we can drive prosperity, not just in the auto sector, but in every uh, sector of the province's economy. That's why we brought forward the Restoring Ontario's Competitiveness Act. And prior to that, we brought in the Making Ontario Open for Business Act, which uh, undid a lot of the job-killing legislation that was brought in by the previous Liberal government under Bill 148, a bill that was actually uh, set off alarm bells at great companies like Magna that are working in the auto sector and warned a bill like that would decimate our sector. That's why we immediately got to work and unwound Bill 148 so that we could continue to create the good Once. jobs. And the sector agrees, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you that the driving prosperity plan that we announced last week has has been celebrated by the auto sector. Finally, they have a government that's listening, not boycotting and paying money in advertising. Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. David Prasenko here today is the father of seven-year-old Kaylee, 
who was diagnosed with autism just before her third birthday. Kaylee requires 20 hours of intensive ABA IBI therapy a week to maintain the progress she has made. This costs $66,000 a year. When the Liberal government announced their plan to cut funding for children with autism after five years of age, Kaylee was cut off just three months into treatment. She regressed. Now under this government, Kaylee has been let down again, Mr. Speaker. Her father told me the Conservative government's changes are disastrous, and he cannot possibly afford the treatment that Kaylee needs. David said he might have to quit his job, divorce his wife, and possibly leave this great province of Ontario in order to save Kaylee's life. Question. What does the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services have to say to dedicated parents like David, you might want to look at him, whose lives will be ruined by the government's changes to the Ontario Autism Program? Once again, before I ask the minister to respond, I would remind the members to make their comments through the chair. In response to the question, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite for bringing her constituents' concerns to the floor of this assembly. Uh, David and Kaylee, it's uh, good of you to be here today. Uh, that said, we are 100 percent committed to ensuring that we provide more flexible support to David and Kaylee. We also have to balance that with the fact that we have 23,000 children on a waiting list that is indefinite. We need to ensure that there is support for all children, which is why we have doubled our investment into diagnostic hubs so we can get quicker diagnosis for children so we can ensure that Order. those between the ages of zero and five are getting more support when we know through evidence that it helps children. That is uh, early intervention and that is key. We are committed to ensuring that we clear that 23,000 uh, person-child wait list so we Bonds. can actually directly invest and empower parents so that they can make the choices for their own family, whether that's a technological aid, behavioral therapy, respite care, or caregiver training. Supplementary, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children, Community and Social Services. Since the government's cuts to autism funding, I have received hundreds of emails and calls from distraught parents. Parents like Jen Fitzgerald, whose son waited nearly two years to access a program to help him better communicate and express his emotions. Her son started the program just last month. But now, because of this government's cuts, Jen has no idea what support her son will receive. She told me, and I quote, she is staring into an abyss when it comes to her son's care and his future. Jen wants to be able to support him as best she can so that her son can be an independent and contributing member of society, but she needs help. Minister, why are you hurting instead of helping Jen's family and families like hers? And, and once again, I will ask the members to make their comments, direct their comments through the chair. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the member opposite uh, talking about Jen and letting us know a little bit more, more about her story. For the past uh, 13 years, I have travelled across this province and uh, met with families whose children have autism. In fact, I uh, worked with my former NDP opponent, Laurel Gibbons, uh, to create the South Nepean Autism Centre, uh, which we funded through our community. We fundraised uh, so that we could provide support uh, and respite support for those families. It's a matter that I have taken to heart with the Minister of Health. In fact, in the 2007 election, she and I had crafted the policy uh, that our then leader, Mayor Tory, had, uh, had uh, presented. This is very near and dear to my heart, and it's, it's important for me to continue to speak to the families, but I do have an obligation for all children in the program. And I would like the member opposite to understand that there is no cut here. It was a $256 million budget, and I've expanded that Response. to $321 million. But I'm also going to clear the wait list of the 23,000 children who have received no support under the previous government. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, yesterday we learned that families earning minimum wage will receive a clawback under your government's autism program. 
Can you tell this House why you are choosing to keep families in poverty so that they can look after their children with dignity? Families are pouring into our constituency offices. They are telling us about the hardship that this program is creating. They are depressed. They are without hope. This program is a disgrace. I see the tears of the people who are in this chamber. We hear them. We see you. Will this minister tell families why Question. you expect that families earning minimum wage are able to provide the services that they need for their children. How are they going to do that? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I think the member opposite is misinformed. Those making minimum wage will be supported in this government in a variety of different ways, including our lift tax credit. They'll also be receiving uh, close to 99% of their, the entitlement uh, throughout this program, which is up to $140,000 per child uh, throughout their lifetime. But what's a disgrace? What's a disgrace is for 15 years, that member and her party had an opportunity to invest into autism order. services. Instead, they took Official opposition come to order. They cut funding, and they left me a system that wasn't even broken. It was bent. So come I order. asked the member opposite if she can stand in her place and look at herself in the mirror for denying 23,000 children in this province support. Stop the clock. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister. She told families impacted by autism on the campaign trail that she would look out for them. Instead, she is stabbing them in the back. A fundamental principle of a child diagnosed with autism is that their needs are unique. They are different. They are not the same. Why is your program ignoring this difference? It is a fundamental principle of autism. Why is this government refusing to provide kids with autism with the support that they need? A little bit of care is simply not enough. Why is this government choosing to balance its Question. books on the backs of kids with autism and their families. Government side, come to order. Government side, come to order. Minister, response. It takes a lot of nerve for a member of this assembly affiliated with the Liberal Party Government of side, Ontario come to, order. to stand up and speak about defending parents and children with autism. I refuse to ignore the three out of four children Member in this for province Hamilton who have Mountain autism, as her government did. I refuse to cut funding in this program, as her Dependent government members did. Come to I order. refuse to allow a program where children wait on a wait list indefinitely. That's not going to happen on my watch. We are going to implement a fair balanced Member for Ottawa South, come and to sustainable order. program that lifts 23,000 children they left on a wait list for Orleans, come to off order. and into service. That's what we're going to do as a government. <laughs> Next question. Start the clock. Member for flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Attorney General. Speaker, our government knows that our law enforcement professionals right across Ontario are hardworking women and men who put their safety at risk every day they go out on the job. These women and men are everyday heroes who work tirelessly to keep us safe in Hamilton, my community, in Kenora and right across Ontario. We've heard time and again that the current Special Investigations Unit process wastes time, energy, and precious resources investigating the wrong things. Under the current system, an officer who provided CPR could face a nearly year-long investigation if the injured person did not survive their injuries. They deserve better. Speaker, could the minister tell us about how this new legislation 
proposes to fix this problem. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Fl from Flanborough, Glanbrook for her question. Our legislation will, if passed, provide transparency and clarity to police officers, police chiefs, and to the people of Ontario. Under the proposed changes, the SIU would be required to conclude an investigation in 120 days or provide an explanation of why that benchmark cannot be met. Notification would continue to be required, Mr. Speaker, in set circumstances we would all reasonably expect, such as when use of force, custody or detention, and motor vehicle pursuits result in serious injury or death, as well as in reported cases of sexual assault and when there is discharge of a firearm at a person. However, for example, in the CPR case the member outlined, or when an officer is unsuccessful in stopping a suicide attempt, those officers do not deserve to be subjected to months-long criminal investigations. Response. If passed, this legislation would clarify the mandate of the SIU and focus its resources where they should be, on possible criminal activity. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. And Mr. Speaker, this is evidence that our government for the people listens to the concerns of frontline officers. This new legislation is balanced, it's respectful, it is fair. Mr. Speaker, I know that frontline officers in my community and right across Ontario will be happy with these changes to SIU investigations if it is passed. I think we can all agree that whether an officer is unsuccessful at saving a victim's life through CPR or at stopping a suicide attempt, that officer should be recognized for his or her efforts and not treated like a suspect in a criminal investigation. Can the minister tell this House more about these proposed changes? The Attorney General. Thank you. And I, I would like to be clear. Our government knows that the women and men in uniform are everyday heroes. And I would like to take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to highlight one such hero in our midst who sits in our caucus, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Mr. Speaker, he was a proud member of the OPP before continuing to serve our community in the House. Sadly, when the previous Liberal government looked at police officers, all they saw were potential offenders. Their policing legislation, Bill 175, was plain and simple anti-police. Bill 175 made Ontario less safe by weakening the trust between the public and the police and by ignoring the everyday reality of the jobs that the police do to keep us safe. My ministry and our government know that effective police oversight and respect for police go hand in hand and that police officers are the hardworking men and women who deserve Response. our respect and support. We listen to the concerns of our frontline officers and that's why we're proposing to restore transparency and fairness to a system that had previously left the police and the people in the dark. Thank you. Next question, the member for Timmins. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, Tyler Stone is a father of three in Timmins. Two of his young children live with severe autism. Tyler has had to leave his career at the hospital to take care of these two kids, leaving his family to rely on one income. Although the Stone family was one of the 23,000 families on the wait list for IBI therapy, they were hopeful because at least they knew that the care their children need would be coming. Minister, and to the Premier directly, one income, on one income, how is Tyler supposed to come up with the $60,000, $80,000 a year needed per child that is needed to pay for intensive IBI therapy? Premier. Uh, Minister of Children and Community Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Order. Members of the opposition will know that it's within the standing orders to allow ministers to refer questions to each other. The question has been referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much. and uh, thank the member opposite for his question and for bringing uh, Tyler Stone's um, uh, story to this assembly. Uh, the member opposite has a distinguished career in this House, and uh, I've known him for the past 13 years, and so I am going to level with him. Tyler Stone's children, if they're Order. on the wait list, are going to be on the wait list under the old program indefinitely. That means those children would have received no support from their Ontario government. I could not, in good conscience, allow that to continue. If the members opposite want to provide false hope to parents, they can do that. 
but I'm here to say today that Tyler's children will be eligible for Opposition up to $140,000 throughout their lifetime, and there will be a flexible ability to, for them to manage their childhood budget so that they can invest in behavioral therapy, technological aids, and other services at the parents' order. own choosing. Thank you. Member for Muskegon, James Bay. My question is for the Premier. My question is for the Premier. A young boy from Capus Casing requires 20 hours of therapy every week. But under this government's plan, Cedric will only be offered a mere two hours a week. That is one tenth of what he has been prescribed by his specialist. His family will be forced to pay out of pocket for costs not covered by this government, as well as the cost to travel from, for two hours every day to and from Timmins to receive treatment. Family and children deserve so much better than to be pushed onto long waiting lists or into bankruptcy. We have a moral responsible responsibility towards those in need. Premier, Question. do you think that Sidlik should be without the education, the support and the care he deserved, yes or no? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I appreciate the member opposite's question. I also appreciated him sending me over Cedric's picture, beautiful little boy uh, from his community. I want to assure the member opposite that as we move forward with this plan, we will be sending more support to the north, and we will ensure that there is greater diagnostic uh, support in the hubs there so that we can provide additional resources. But let me be perfectly clear. As I stand here and I communicate this plan to Ontarians, this really is about fairness, equity, and sustainability. Sure. We have increased the budget for this program from $250 Opposition million to, order. to $321 million. We have uh, sustained the previous program by injecting an, an emergency $100 million into the program, but our goal is to ensure Response. that the 23,000 children who weren't receiving support in the province of Ontario before, that's three out of four children who have autism in this province, will now receive support. Thank you. Next question. Member for Kitchener Conestoga. My question is for the Minister, the Minister of Transportation. Recently, our government made a fantastic announcement in Kitchener about GO expansion. We are committed to decreasing the gridlock in the City of Toronto and across the province. We are getting people of Ontario moving so they can spend more time with family and loved ones. In December, the minister announced more train service in the mornings and evenings between Kitchener and Toronto. This was great news for people in Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph, Acton, and Georgetown. Our government for the people is expanding GO service faster and years earlier than the Liberals had planned. With the announcement, the demand for more GO service became very clear. Can the Minister of Transportation share with the House the additional news about the Kitchener line that was announced this week or last week? Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, thank the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for that question and for continuing to work with me on the transportation file. As uh, he stated, our government uh, is working and committed to decreasing gridlock and getting people of Ontario moving. We are doing this ahead of what was the previous government's planned schedule because we are working with our valued partners to accel accelerate the timelines with GO expansion. This is an important step for our government's plan to deliver two-way, all-day GO transit to and from Kitchener and Toronto. Last Last week, our government announced uh, the popular 450 express train would return to better serve those uh, Ontarians in demanding more service. Mr. Speaker, the reintroduction of the train was because of the great advocacy work of my fellow PC caucus members. And I'd like to take the opportunity to shout out and thank them, the members from Kitchener, Conestoga, Order. the Kitchener from South Hespler, Cambridge, Brampton West and Brampton South Response. for amazing advocacy work. They were in contact with me from day one to work for a solution. We found that capacity had really grown in the system, and it's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, that the did not Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you uh, to the minister, thank you for that answer. I know the people of Waterloo Region appreciate the reintroduction of the 450 Express train as it allows them more options to get where they need to be. Our government saw the demand and acted quickly to reinstate, uh, reinstate the Express train. Our government is finding better and smarter ways to work with our partners and current infrastructure to deliver more transit rides faster at a lower cost to the people. 
Our government will continue to deliver reliable transit to the people of Kitchener with the goal of providing all-day two-way go from Kitchener to Toronto. Can the minister expand more on our government for the people's plan to expand go rail service? Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to that member again for his question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on June 7th, our government was elected, and we are elected for the people, and we are going to expand GO Transit throughout this province, despite, despite the opposition from members across the way. Mr. Speaker, by working with our partner at CN, we are able to speed up the timelines for GO expansion across the province. Kitchener is but one example of this great partnership. We are expanding GO service years, years ahead of schedule by speeding up our no negotiations to free up track space. Mr. Speaker, that is how we will deliver two-way all-day GO Transit to Kitchener way ahead of the proposed schedule. Our government is committed to improving transit across Ontario, and we've made it clear in our mandate to get the people of Ontario moving. We have several projects moving already, including new commuter service to St. Catharines and Niagara Falls. And Mr. Speaker, we have more to come. Response. Hey. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is to the Premier. Uh, in my riding, Sarah is raising two wonderful children who have autism. Her children have very different needs. Gwen currently receives 14 hours of therapy per week, while Ivy requires less. She requires two hours. Under your program, Sarah will, Sarah will be $37,000 short in paying for Gwen's therapy. The minister and even her parliamentary assistant are ignoring the fact that autism is a spectrum with diverse needs, and your plan will fail kids like Gwen who need more support. Does the Premier understand how damaging this program is to families across this province? And will you hold your minister and your parliamentary assistant to account for rolling out a flawed plan for children who have autism? Premier. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member opposite. For, for Essex, come to order. Um, I appreciate uh, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's concerns, um, but I'll be perfectly honest. I worked very hard with my parliamentary assistant, Amy Fee, in crisscrossing this province. Amy herself, in my opinion, is the ideal member of provincial parliament. She arrived here as member a for Waterloo, come to order. Two, uh, four children, two of whom have autism, and she has put the children on that wait list, those 23,000 children that were never going to get support under the previous Liberal plan, she put them first. And that means we are going to put forward a fair and equitable plan that has increased spending from a $256 billion Opposition come to order. To Response. $321 million. We are doubling the investment into diagnostic hubs, and as importantly, we're giving parents flexibility and choice in the system and how Supplementary. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Kelly Russell is one of my constituents, a mother with a six-year-old son living with autism. Kelly applied for the OAP with Erin Oak Kids in December 2016 for ABA therapy. She waited for two years while a Liberal plan failed her. Erin Oak Kids now can't tell Kelly where her son is on the wait list. Under the new Conservative plan, the funding she is entitled to won't even come close to covering her son's therapy. And Mr. Speaker, Kelly writes, they are holding the key to my child's future in their hands. Why has the minister drastically cut funding for children over the age of five? Minister. You can refer to the minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And uh, I'm happy to address Kelly directly on this. What the member opposite isn't telling Kelly and, and some of the others who are interested in this field is that that wait list at Erin Oak was indefinite. They couldn't tell her where her child was on the list because it would probably take years and years and years. For Waterloo, so come to order. Member instead, for Hamilton Mountain, to Kelly, come to order. At home, what I've done instead is I have increased the budget for this program from $256 million to $321 million. And what I'm going to do is directly invest 
in Erin Oaks so that I can uh, double the investment on uh, diagnostic hubs, and then once the children have the diagnosis, they're going to be funded directly so that they can get service in their community, or they could get a technological Response. aid, or they could get caregiver training or respite care. That's what Tech Kelly is going to be entitled to with this program. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Minister, it has been over six months since we learned the true depths of the Liberals' waste and mismanagement. Fifteen billion deficit surprised us all. But our government got to work immediately to fix the mess we inherited. I'm so proud to support the fall economic statement in which we found 3.2 billion in efficiencies and wherein we were able to return $2.7 billion back to the hardworking Ontarians. In the months that have followed, we're working hard to make life more affordable, reduce red tape, and make sure the world knows Ontario is open for business and it is open for jobs. Mr. Speaker, the results speak for themselves. Could the minister please give us an update on the success of our plan in recent months? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Malton. Last week, we were very pleased to share the progress that we have made in restoring Ontario's fiscal health. We can now report, Speaker, that the deficit stands at $13.5 billion. That is $1.5 billion lower than the $15 billion deficit we inherited from the Liberals. Speaker, it is clear our plan is working. Our government is making Ontario open for business. We're making sure that we're open for jobs by restoring confidence, reducing the mountain of regulations and red tape. Remember, the, speak the Liberals were spending $40 million a day more than they brought in, okay. Speaker. Okay. We still have a lot of work to do, but we remain focused in putting Ontario back on a responsible path to balance in order to protect the key services that matter most. Supplementary. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, my constituents, like most Ontarians, are concerned how the Liberal mismanaged to make Ontario the most indebted sub-national government on the planet. Our opposition clearly thinks that instead of solving wasteful spending, the government should tax everything and make life more expensive. Mr. Speaker, the previous government only knew two words, tax and spend. On the contrast, our government has replaced those two words with fiscal responsibility. Can the minister further inform this House how the government is working to get Ontario fiscal house back in order responsibly? Thank you, Mr. Minister. President, President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the question. And thank you for that. Tax and spend may be the motto of the opposition, but here's what we are for. We ended March Madness spending. We launched the Audit and Accountability Committee. We restricted travel and hospitality. We reviewed spending line by line. And we saved, most importantly, $3.2 billion while doing that, Mr. Speaker. And we did this while ensuring people don't slip. I would ask. The, the, member, the guests who are here, you have to uh, allow Parliament to proceed. You, if you don't stop, we will have to ask you to leave. Sergeant at Arms, we need to remove the person who's disrupting the proceedings. President of the Treasury Board can conclude his answer. Thank you. Once again, I would ask whoever's. Oh, that's the same person. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we did this so that people don't slip through the cracks, Mr. Speaker. The left tax credit means that low income Ontarians will pay zero provincial income taxes. 
Mr. Speaker, the truth is this government has to make order. tough choices. Mr. Position Speaker, come to order. it is our moral imperative to make the choices needed so that our province is fiscally sustainable, not just for our children, but our children's children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Kelly McGarry lives in Kingston with her son, Braden, who was diagnosed with autism. Braden waited nearly two years for intensive treatment, but it was worth it. The treatment was life-changing. But this April, after the government's cuts, Braden will only receive a fraction of what his treatment costs. Under the new program, he would not even have qualified for the intensive intervention because of his age. Kelly's husband has given up a career managing a staff of 20 to care for their son. They remortgaged their home. Kelly told me, and I quote, I don't know what else to do. What will happen to the children who will not receive therapy because of this government's plan? Premier. Community Social Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social thanks, Services. Uh, thanks Order. very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for uh, asking the question uh, for Kelly and Braden. I guess the question I have back to the member opposite is why did he think that 23,000 children on an indefinite wait list should receive no support at all from their Ontario government? I've heard a lot of, uh, from, from the members opposite about the faint hope that they're trying to provide to Ontario families. I've, I've heard from the members opposite that they're trying to portray this as a cut when it's Member for Hamilton Mountain, I've heard come from the members opposite that, uh, that they're trying to uh, suggest to moms and dads that if their child is on the wait list that they were getting off. I have to tell you, Speaker, when I became the minister responsible for this portfolio on June 29th, this was one of the first files I looked at. We had Response. staff and ministers in tears looking at what the Liberals had left us, and I, in good conscience, could not allow this continue to continue, which is why we are going Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, I met with Rebecca Haight, a concerned parent of an eight-year-old son on the autism spectrum. Rebecca is from Thorold and is here in the gallery today. For years, thousands of children with autism have been, do have been on long wait lists, desperate for support. Rebecca was one of those families. When her son was not getting the early intervention he needed, she applied for a loan of $100,000. This is an impossible situation for working families. It is unsustainable. The minister's plan could bankrupt many families, moving them from wait lists to a situation where they are forced to borrow money for services they need for their children. Does the minister understand the devastation her plan will cause for everyday families like Rebecca's all across Ontario? Minister. Thanks very much uh, to the member opposite for bringing Rebecca's uh, concerns to the floor of the legislature. I'd like to welcome Rebecca uh, to this assembly. The previous program was inflexible. We are going to provide a family uh, with uh, up to $140,000 in a childhood budget that they can use between the ages of 0 and 18, recognizing that early intervention is key, so we're going to front-end that uh, investment into our children who are, who, who are um, between the ages of 0 and 5. We're also going to make sure that when we clear the Diagnostic Hub wait list that we are going to directly fund these parents so that they can make the decision if they want a technological aid, behavioral therapy, uh, caregiver uh, support or, uh, care or respite. But, Speaker, let me be perfectly clear. I'm proud Order. that our plan will finally provide families with the freedom Fonts. to choose the best services for their child. This is the plan. The, the New Democrats need to Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the time we have available for question period this afternoon. This morning, right? Member for Scarborough, Gildwood, on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I have a point of order. I'd like to welcome my constituent, Louisa William, who is here in the Members' West Gallery today. Thank you.
Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Toronto St. Paul's has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services concerning autism. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Scarborough Guildwood has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services concerning autism. This matter will also be debated sometime after 6 p.m. today. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.